at Eaton. That was very good. Thanks for sharing that. Anyone else with a testimony? I know I want to share my testimony. I know last week we talked about, um, about trying to eat more at, at regular times and um, trying to eat where, you know, you know, not eat it in a rush and all of that. Because you know, when you do that, eating in a rush, you do not, your, you, um, your digestive juices are not there to digest the food and you are so anxious. So my, my challenge this week, because I work nights, um, was to try and have a regular time that I can eat when I'm off and at the same time when I'm working. So when I'm working, I like to try and eat in between there so I can stay awake. <laughs> so my challenge for the week was not to eat at work until five o'clock, six o'clock in, in the morning, because that's around the time I will eat when I'm off. So that was a great challenge. So in between, I had to be drinking water, trying to keep my mind off of um, eating so that I can fulfill that, um, that goal. It was difficult. Okay, if we do not have any more testimonies, we are going to move on. And at this time, we are going to bring on our panelists so we can discuss con how to control appetite. So it's my pleasure to be leading out today and have Dr. St. Clair and Emlyn with me. Um, I'm actually going to, we're going to go through a few questions and I'll go through the objectives of what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to actually stop sharing and then reshare my screen again. Um, what we're talking about today is control of appetite. And that is probably one of the most difficult things that all of us are challenged with. I mean, we know in the Bible, there's many stories about you know, people that were challenged with appetite and, and the challenges that they had. So we're going from Councils on Diets and Food, chapter eight. So if you have Councils on Diets and Food, I would encourage you to get your book, get a pen, because we're gonna be going through some real, um, if you have not already read the chapter, you can underline or highlight or make notations, but this is an amazing chapter. And one of the things that we're gonna focus on is how our appetite is related to crime and disease. And what I found this week is that crime and disease associated with intemperance and appetite has increased in every succeeding generation. And so what I did is I invited Dr. Sinclair, my friend, to be on this panel with me today and along with Emmeline, because she is a surgeon and she works with people that are diseased every day. She doesn't take everybody to surgery, but certainly there's some diseases that she sees and that she encounters that she's gonna share in our discussion today about what she is seeing um, in, our, in, our, uh, in our world. So welcome Dr. Sinclair, it's my pleasure that you're here with us today. Thank you. Yeah, so, so we're gonna, this is the topic today is kind of centered around crime and disease and intemperance and appetite, but we have a lot of good news. So we're gonna share with that. I actually have some questions that I'll be answering, asking um, Emmeline and Dr. Sinclair, and we'll just have a little bit of dialogue about it. But I wanna give a little introduction. So today, the things that we're gonna talk about are three main, three main things we're gonna talk about today. Please forgive me. Three main things we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna to talk about the problems that are caused by uncontrolled appetite in eating, drinking, and even what we wear. We're gonna talk about our obligations to God of controlling our appetite, which helps us to care for the body, the soul, and the faculties entrusted to us. So we have to be really good stewards of these bodies. And then last, we're gonna, lastly, we're gonna talk about practical solutions for controlling the appetite and resisting, and that's the key word today, resisting temptation. So one of the strongest temptations that man has to meet is upon the point of appetite. I don't know if you knew that or not, but I was very surprised to read that, but it's true because we know in the beginning that was the temptation that man failed at and we continue to have be challenged with. So one of the greatest evils or the first great evil was the intemperance in eating and drinking. Men and women 
have made themselves slaves to appetite. Just last week or a week before I was talking to Emma on how I like this vegan ice cream that's called peanut butter and raspberry, very delicious. And I went in the store, but I had already made the promise that I was gonna move away from eating my vegan ice cream because there's a lot of sugar in it. And so wouldn't you know, I found myself over by the freezer section. And I said to myself, why are you over here? <laughs> you promised that you're not going to eat that vegan ice cream any longer. And so the reason I tell that story is because many times we have difficult with our appetites because we take ourselves to the places where we know that we shouldn't be. Had Eve not been by the, the tree that God said not to be by, the temptation would not have been as great. But there's a statement that was in this reading this week. It says, Satan's strongest hold on man, strongest hold on man is through the appetite and this he seeks to stimulate in every possible way. And so we're gonna start our discussion now of talking about control of appetite. We know that it is a choice, but what I've learned and you probably have learned too, that many of our choices begin in childhood and then they go through adulthood. And as you can see, the little girl has the same challenges as the adult has. So we know that there are problems uh, caused by uncontrolled appetite um, and we're going to talk about that. So the first question I have for our panels is, so what are some of the dangers of excessive eating and drinking? Let's hear what your thoughts are. Okay. Um, before I answer, I'm a surgeon. And let me tell you, when I first started training in surgery and so first started doing surgery, our number one surgery in the country was hernia repairs. Okay, um, over the years that has changed, our number one surgery is removal of person's gallbladder. And that is 100% linked to what we eat. I'll tell you something else before we get into this. When I was a little girl and I was visiting the US, we were blessed because my sister worked for Air Jamaica. So I've been traveling since I was eight years old. And I remember McDonald's used to have a sign that was continually running as to how many millions of burgers they sold. Mm -hmm. By the time I got back here to college, it said um, millions and millions. There's no longer a number. And by the time I finished college and started medical school, it said billions served. Mm -hmm. And now there's not even a sign. And that's just one restaurant, okay? That's just one restaurant. So when you talk about the dangers of excessive eating and drinking, it is, it is a plague that affects us. And it also is something that our church has neglected. Someone comes into our church with a smoking problem or a drug problem. We pray, we find programs, we do everything to help them. But when someone comes into a church who clearly has a problem with appetite, we do nothing. We have no ongoing programs to help them. Okay, now that I've said that, <laughs> um, the dangers of excessive eating and drinking, it, it is in many ways just as dangerous as the things that I mentioned, which are cigarette smoking and drugs, in terms of what happens. Because one of the problems with excessive eating and how we drink, like I said, is not the number one surgery in the country. And it used to be fair, fat, female, 40, second, meaning multiple children. I'm taking out gallbladders in teenagers, in young people who are in their 20s. And that is 100% related to eating. I was looking through the chapter, and by the way, just FYI, if you get the EG White app, you have access to every book and publication that she has ever written. I have many books, but that is how I, I, I didn't, I administer healing, but I did not, when I looked through, and besides I just moved, so I can't find half of my stuff anyway. I just went on my app and I was able to, to pull up the book. So just, that's just an FYI in terms of um, that. But the danger of everything she said in there, when she talked about eating late at night, 
and dyspepsia. All of those things are things that I tell people every day. The other thing you don't know, Dr. Sankey, is that I used to be a critical care surgeon. And so I actually have certification in nutrition from the American Society of Parenteral and Enteral Nutrition. So nutrition is something that I've been dealing with now for years. And the dangers of eating and drinking is that it's almost the roots. Second, the only thing that's worse than eating and drinking with, in terms of excessive is tobacco. And I think if people understood this, they would be more um, accepting of the advice that we give them in terms of what you eat, when you eat, and how you eat. It's not just what you eat, it's, it's the combination of everything. When you eat is also important. How much you eat is important. Whether you eat and drink together is important and what you're drinking is important. I'll give you another quick example. When I was teaching at Morehouse as a professor, a clinical professor of surgery at Morehouse University in the Morehouse Medical School in Atlanta. And I shared office with another female surgeon, which is an enigma of itself to have two women surgeons, but we were both employed at Morehouse. And she is tall, slender. She almost looks like a model. You'd never believe she's a surgeon. Back then I was a little bit more slender myself, but I always drank water. This was just something I got from my mom. Even before I read what Ellen White said, I was never a juice soda drinker, which is a blessing. But she, she had gained some weight, even though she still looked to most people as slender. I knew her when she was like really skinny. And she said she was trying to lose weight. And I said to her, stop drinking. She would always have a juice because even those juices, um, like a grapefruit juice and stuff, the bottled one for breakfast. And then she would have a, I said, if you stop drinking, I said, look how many calories. The, the, what they do, there's a trick, right? It says so many calories per serving, but the bottle or even the can is two and a half servings. Who drinks, who's gonna share it up? You're not, but that's what they have on there to say, well, we only have so many calories per serving, but when you look at the juice cans and you look at the, the bottle, the, the soda cans, it's one, two and a half, even three servings. Okay. So I told her, I said, if you just stop drinking juice, if you just do that alone, because she wasn't, she wasn't an excessive eater. We both had very active lifestyles. She had small children. I hadn't had any children. I haven't had Joanne yet. Her children are a little older. So she was an active person. And, you know, she did that. And she ended up losing enough weight that she gave me like three, because I was, I wasn't fat, but she was really slender. And so she ended up losing enough weight. I got three of her beautiful wool pants, which were so nice because we were in Atlanta. And because she's tall, it's hard to get pants that fit you all the way down to your ankle. So that was a blessing that I got just from giving some good advice to somebody. Just that's all she did. She stopped drinking the juice, which she thought was healthy for breakfast, and she stopped drinking sodas. So it, it can be very simple, the solution, but I think part of the problem is we don't realize that how dangerous it is because second to tobacco, obesity is the biggest killer in our country. And the reason it is excessive eating and drinking. So thank you, Dr. Sinclair. That was very informative. So you heard that not only are we clear that the gallbladder is now coming out, that's the number one surgery, just simply, and it can be prevented by what we eat and drink. And so be mindful of what we're putting in our bodies. I mean, it's so dangerous that you can end up in surgery if you're not careful what you eat and drink. And what I like what you said, Dr. Sinclair, is when we know someone has a tobacco problem or a drinking or a problem, we are quick to... I think somebody needs to mute. So, oh, thank uh, you. It is important that we do not take this lightly. In fact, I want to highly stress, and we'll talk about this a little later, but our control of appetite has every, everything to relate to our spirituality, our relationship with God, our eternal salvation. So I want that to be really clear. So Emily, talk a little bit about some of the biblical accounts of uncontrolled appetite. Tell me, give me a few examples. Well, from the beginning, right? Yes. I, I, I always thought about it, you know, from the beginning, 
you think of, um, and it was a Filipino um, couple that made a presentation many years ago at church that maybe even thinking, you know, I, I always love mangoes and I never thought. And she said, you know, we're going to have the best mangoes in heaven because, you know, the Philippines, like the Caribbean also has good mangoes. And I began to think about it. And I said, if you think of the best mango you have ever had, the ones in heaven and certainly the ones that were in the Garden of Eden were 10 times better, maybe even 100 times better. And here you are in a perfect environment. And the, 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 the biggest example, of course, is the reason we're still here today is Eve, I mean, she wasn't hungry. And that's the problem. If we were eating when we were hungry, we wouldn't have a problem. But she wasn't hungry. She just saw it and the shepherd, the, the serpent lied to her. It says we're made in the image of God. He says, you'll be like God. Well, we're already like God. And, and that's what it is. You have something there where you're completely satisfied, but you're going to this fruit because someone tells you something. And, and coming back to what I said earlier, I, I rarely ever watch regular TV anymore. Years ago, I stopped. Then I had cable for a few years. Now I don't have cable. I moved, so I'm in a new house. I, the other community had cable as part of the package. I didn't have a choice. So now I don't, like I said, I listen to brief news, but I don't watch the news. But even if you watch TV for an hour, count how many food commercials are in that. There are food commercials, there are legal commercials, and there are car commercials. Those are the three repeating commercials in any program if you watch for an hour or so. Here's a fact. If you're not in an accident, which may only happen to you every now and then, you're not gonna call Dan Newland or anybody else, okay? So the fact that they have multiple law commercials doesn't mean a whole lot. Once you have a car, you're not gonna go out and buy a car, no matter how many pretty car commercials. But the one commercial that you can actually act upon is a food commercial. <laughs> and if for every commercial break, you have two, three, and four food commercials, you're just watching the news. You're not watching anything, or you're even watching a good program. Nothing that's, you know, bad. A, a, a show that the entire family can watch. There's no occult in it. There's no nothing. But just watching that program and looking at how many food commercials there are. What do you think is going on in your mind? So... We get back to Eve, you don't touch it. So the serpent starts saying, well, you know, you're missing out. And that's a problem with our appetite. We're not eating because we're hungry. We're eating because we think it's gonna fulfill something else in us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and here we are, sin problem years later. So she's the first one. The other one that came to mind of course, is Esau. Now, I remember when I was a little girl and, and so on, and you know, we said, oh, we're hungry, we're starving. My father used to say, you are not starving, okay? People in Africa are starving. <laughs> you are not starving. But that's what we say. We say stupid things like that. We're starving, we're not starving. So it comes to the next account, which is Esau. You know, oh, send me your birthright. Oh, I'm going to die in a minute. So what does it matter? You're not going to die in a minute. And he just flippantly sells his birthright. And we do the same thing today. When we overeat, when we it's nine o'clock at night, and yes, we may be a little hungry, instead of just having just something tiny, just enough to prevent our stomach from not growling throughout the night, we decide we're going to eat a full meal as if it's four o'clock in the afternoon. You know, so those are the two bad examples. Now I have good examples, but those are the two bad examples that I thought about immediately, Eve and Esau. Emily, did you think of anyone? Yeah, well, you know, what I was thinking about as Dr. Sinclair was um, speaking, I realized Satan, Satan knows. He knows that appetite is our greatest downfall. So therefore, he attacks us with our appetite. And I, it brings to mind that when after Jesus, 
fasted for 40 days in the wilderness, the first thing that the devil came to Christ with was his appetite. He tempted him because he knew he was hungry. He told Christ, if you're hungry, you're God. Why not turn these stones into bread? So even Christ, God, Jesus, was tempted with appetite. How much more we as humans um, need to be very careful with appetite because appetite is the greatest downfall. You know, um, the, the children of Israel, when they were in Egypt, they were crying and begging that they need, they want to leave because of the, the ill treatment they were receiving. But do you know when they, when they finally got relief, God allowed them to leave, they were in the wilderness, the children of Israel started thinking back on the food, the flesh food that they were eating, that they got back in Egypt. And they were very upset with Moses that he brought them out from Egypt, despite the ill treatment they were receiving. And they were begging basically to go back to Egypt because they wanted to eat meat and other things that they were accustomed to in Egypt. So appetite can make you really distort your, your thinking process. It can cause you to do things that you really not, if you're thinking, you know, you will not really do these things. So that's why we have to make sure that we keep our appetite under control, under the, the guidance of God so we can make these wise decisions. The Babylonians, when they were eating and drinking, Nebuchadnezzar eating and drinking, he had the biggest, greatest um, um, city. No, it, nobody could penetrate it. Unbeknownst to him while he was eating and drinking, the Medes and Persians were digging their way underneath um, and got into the, the, the city and was able to conquer Babylon, the great city. So appetite is the key. If we can control our appetites, we will be in such better condition. You know, you're so right, Emlyn. I know that, you know, as I was reading this week in Chinese, it talked about excessive eating and drinking indicate that we are in the end time. And so it is so important that we don't take light of this topic that we're talking about today, because we see it all around us. Dr. Sinclair mentioned, the rate of obesity is so high now, and it is a clear indicator of people overeating and over drinking and not eating at proper times and in improper eating of the types of food. And so we have to be very clear that this topic is really critical that we talk about it now, because as we see what we see, we know Christ is soon to come. As in the days of Noah, as it was in Sodom and Gomorrah, all of those were direct relationship of what people were eating and drinking, lack of self-control. And at each of those junctures with Noah, God had to destroy the entire world, except for those eight who chose to go in the ark and be obedient to God. In Sodom and Gomorrah, he had to destroy the people because clearly he gave warning after warning after warning. I believe that God now is giving us warnings. He's giving, even Emma and I, we thought we talked about this last year doing councils on diets and food. We were wondering how we were going to do it. We're like, we got to do it. If it's just us on the line, we need it for ourselves, but we want to share it with other people as well. And so we believe in our heart of hearts that the reason we're talking about this today is because Jesus is soon to come. And what we eat and drink and do does matter for salvation. It is so critical. And so we know that. And so we know that when we disregard the um, nature's laws, it can lead to irritable temper. We know people who are irritable, a confused brain, unstrong nerves. You heard people say, oh, that person gets on my nerves. Why? Is it what we're eating? Is it what we're drinking? Is it because we're unrestrained appetite? We become inefficient, meaning that we're not even as efficient as we should be or productive as we should do. 
Sometimes we become unreliable. Oh, I forgot. I really meant to do that for you. I promised you I would do it. I forgot. And it's simply because our minds are so clouded many times that we do not remember. And sometimes our bodies are just in a, a state of disorder. Dr. Sinclair mentioned about how the gallbladder, which is our critical, critical for the for the functioning of digestion and everything, it is now overloaded so much, taxed so much, many times it has to be because they have confuse the gallbladder. They're eating all the time. So it doesn't know, should I be secreting? Should I not be secreting? And all of these things are a direct relationship to a disregard of nature's laws. So we know that failure of self-control is a sin. We need to get that in our mind very clear. And that it leads to destruction, unless we make a U-turn and turn around. We, uh, we've heard the story about Adam and Eve and Noah's day saw Israel some of the more, and even in our world today, when we do not have control of our appetite, it is truly a sin and we need to call it by its name. So in Councils on Diets and Food on page 146, it says eating, drinking, and dressing to such excess that they become crimes. Crimes. They are among the marked sins of the last days and constitutes a sign of Christ's soon coming. They're crimes and they are signs. They are crimes and they are signs. And we have to be clear in our mind as it relates to that. So our eternal welfare, welfare depends upon the use we make during the, we, during the time we live, our strength and our influence. So what we do with these bodies that God gave to us really does matter. People are watching what you eat. People are watching what you drink. People are watching what you do. And not only if you don't do it correctly, not only are you failing God, but you're leading other people maybe down a path that they should not. So the next question I have for our panelists is, what are our obligations to God of, of appetite control, caring for the body and soul and the faculties entrusted to us? What are those obligations? I'll start with either you or Emlyn or Dr. Sinclair. One of the things that I, I'm just going to say here, you know, even though I'm not vegetarian, I still, do still have a significant plant base in my diet. But my daughter is vegetarian, and people used to ask me, why did you do that? Because I, I realized, because on and off, I've been blessed to go to West of this College, Andrews, and Loma Linda. So I have been kind of vegetarian on and off over the years. But I realized how difficult it is once you start eating meat to stop. So I decided that if she didn't eat meat, she'd be fine. And guess what? I was right. The other thing I did when she was younger is that I put no cheese and anything on my vegetables. I just made sure the vegetables had a little seasoning and that's how she had them. So all of this stuff, you know, broccoli and it's covered in cheese and all that kind of stuff. No, I did do it. One mistake I made, I think a little bit too much mac and cheese because we weren't vegan. So I think I gave a little bit too much of the um, mac and cheese and I, I probably should have changed that in, for, in terms of what I did. But those are things I did because this is what I, you remember that thing, Desiderata, children learn what they live. Mm -hmm. If they grow with this, they, they, that thing was always in my mind. And I always said, if she grows up thinking that this is the normal way to eat, always having vegetables with her meals, always having food, drinking water, we don't eat and drink. That's something I just never did. Even before I read it in Sister White's writing, I just never did it, praise God. So all of those good habits, I started from when she was little. And now she's very healthy. Exercise, part of her life. She eats, you know, um, well, and she looks well. I'm saying that to say it's hard for individuals to say that you're in a family and you're gonna start eating well, you're gonna control your appetite if you're the only one. Mm -hmm. So first thing we need to do is pray because I think that's where a lot of people make mistakes. Mm -hmm. They try to do everything else, but when it comes to weight loss, controlling your appetite, living better, we just think we're gonna follow this and follow that. And not that what we're saying is not important, but the first thing you gotta do is pray because control of the appetite will control your entire life. And so we need to pray, but we need to institute things at an early age for those with children. 
And if we are later in life, then we still need to realize the benefit. The importance of the, to control the appetite is that if you can control the appetite by God's grace, you can control so many other things in your life. Not just what you eat or drink, but how you relate to people, um, whether or not you're snappy or kind, you know, it, 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 does a whole world of stuff, whether or not you get a good night's rest because you're not eating so late at night with a full stomach and all kinds of stuff. So the importance of controlling appetite, it will control our entire health and well-being if we give God control over this appetite. Amen. Amen. So that is so true. That's why it's important that we control our appetite because you're right. It, it really does affect our relationship with God and other people. Any other thoughts you know, you about that? Yeah, um, you know, what Dr. Sinclair was saying, it is so true because I I realize how important it is you know, to eat um, and to train up your children to eat the right way because I have a similar experience. I um, was able to um, stay home with my kids. I homeschooled my kids and I was able to stay home with them and I taught them about eating fruits and vegetables. And today my kids have no problem eating mm -hmm. fruits mm -hmm. and vegetables because they know that that's what they, you know, they need to do, not a problem. So if you train up the, ch the children in the right way, as the Bible said, train up a child in the way he should grow, you will not be bad from it. That is so true. And, um, you know, I realized as we all realize our temple is the, um, our body, I should say is the temple of God. And we are stewards of this temple. This temple, our body does not belong to us. It belongs to him. So it, with that in mind, if someone loan you something, you wanna take good care of it because you want to return it to that person the way um, you received it or even a better condition if possible. So I look at it in that manner, in that way, that my body is a temple of God and it's just a loan to me. So therefore I need to take care of this body in a, in a manner that at the end, when, um, when it's required of me or when he comes, he's going to require, uh, inquire, how did I take care of the temple that he loaned to me? So keep that in the back of your mind and um, I'm sure every time you reach for something, you will start thinking, I need to eat healthy. What I'm about to eat here is not healthy. What are the better choices do I have so I can um, um, eat to um, glorify God in my body? Amen. And you know, Jesus, as you mentioned earlier, Emily, was tempted, you know, at a time when you know, after 40 days, I mean, that's, that's a long time. And so what are some of the things that, you know, that Jesus did that we can also do? One of the things that comes to my mind that Jesus did is he quoted scripture. He quoted scripture because Satan came in his face, in his face about appetite. It's not like Jesus was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Like oftentimes we are when we're tempted by our appetite. He literally was in the wilderness preparing for his ministry and Satan came to him. So I think, you know, I know that by quoting scripture and by knowing he knew his obligation to his father, God, that the reason he came to earth was to redeem the world. So he knew that he had a purpose. He knew that his purpose was actually to make sure that he overcame sin so that he can show that the road that he traveled, we too would travel. We too could overcome. Um, and so that's really some of the things that I think of that that Jesus did to be victorious. Number one, knew his purpose for coming. Number two, he quoted scriptures, right? And then only thing he did is he, he, re, he replied with scripture. He didn't debate with Satan. He replied with scripture. And we need to stop debating with people. We need to really start using our scripture as our response. Um, and then that way we can be more successful in being victorious over our appetite. Anything else? Yeah, I think you covered it all. You know, as as human, we are we are frail, and we have um, you know sometimes we're not strong to with 
to withstand Satan's um, darts that he hurls at us. So we have to rely on our savior who walked this road before and who knows, you know, he was in all point tempted just like we are. So he knows how to overcome the devil's darts when he come at after us. So, um, you know, praying, having God on your side. And one of the things I, what I do is I try not to, as Jennifer, you were talking about, you know, putting yourself in a situation where you will be tempted. One of the things I do is I do not buy anything and have it in my house that I know is not healthy. Yeah. So I, so that way I am not even tempted. Even if I'm tempted, I don't have it, so I can eat it. I know one of the things, one of my big points is cheese. I love cheese. And I know if I start eating one piece of cheese, I will not, I will have to eat it until that whole cake of cheese is gone. So therefore I do not buy cheese. I stay away from anything that I know is unhealthy. So we all can do that, you know, stay, do not, purchase things or buy, bring things in your life that you know you 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 have a weakness to you know i i love the um daniel story story and i love daniel 1 8 and it talks about how daniel purposed mm -hmm. in his heart that he would not defile his temple he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat he purposed. So before the temptation came, he had made his mind up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And sometimes we're waiting to the temptation coming out. We want to decide. But he already made his mind up in advance that, that I'm going to care for my body as God's temple, as you mentioned, Emlyn. I love that verse. And no, what? No, you're not that your body is the temple of God. You know, we are bought with the price. Therefore, glorify God in your body, which are his, you know. And I love that verse because we, sometimes we, you know, we, we do not keep presence of mind that our bodies are not our own. We do not own them. Mm -hmm. And so we're the caregivers of them. We're the stewards of them. And so we have the purpose in our heart before the temptation comes, how am I going to treat this body that is on loan to me? Cause you only have one life to live anyway, that is on loan to me so that I can actually glorify God. And I think if we think about it in the context of whatever we eat, drink, or do, that we do it all to the glory of God. Mm -hmm. I'm going to move forward because we only have probably another few minutes to go, but I want to read this, this thing from Councils on Diets and Food. We are under obligation to God to make an unreserved consecration of ourselves to him body and soul with the faculties appreciated as his entrusted gifts. So our bodies are a gift. They're, they're given to us to be employed in his service. That's pretty good news that we're a gift, right? Mm -hmm. That's great news, but we have to consecrate ourselves. We can't just keep doing what we want to do, how we want to do it. We have to make sure that we make that, that effort to say, God, you know, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. And so all of our energies and capabilities are to be constantly, constantly, constantly strengthened and improved, not weakened, but strengthened and improved during this probationary period. Now she wrote this years ago, but we are in a probationary period, meaning the choices we make today will determine our eternal destination tomorrow. Only those who appreciate these principles and have trained to care for their bodies intelligently and in the fear of God should be chosen to take responsibility in this work. Strengthen and improve is what we're trying to do to our bodies because we know we're in a probationary period and we want to be able to show that we fear God by the way we care for our mind, body, and spirit. So what do you think about that statement? Uh if I could say something real quick, Jennifer, we talked about Daniel, mm -hmm. Ananias, Michelle, and Azariah. I think a lot of times we forget that they were not the only four Hebrew boys who were captured. Okay? 
a whole mess of people were taken, including other people. But those four friends had a dedication to God and they stuck together. I say that to say, you're talking about how can we control our appetite? That's one of the ways in which we can do. We can stick together as friends, you know, we can get a partner, a buddy. Um, and, you know, even with COVID, we now have means of communication. What Nilka, Skeet and I used to do is that we would call each other and say, I'm going for my walk now. Okay, I'm going. She lives in Apopka. I live in Claremont. And so we just kept each other in check. I'm going to the gym now. Uh, okay, I'm going to go for. And we cannot underestimate the importance of being around people with like mind. People who will say, um, you know, we, we're, we're doing this together, you and I. And I think we that's one of the ways in which we're lacking because I think many times we try to 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 do this thing alone because there's a certain shame and you know being overweight and so on. But if you get a partner, even if the partner is not overweight, or if even if both of you are, and you're trying to do it, if you do it together, two people, the, the Solomon says, two people, their strength, a threefold cord is not easily broken. So if you have two or three people together, you can encourage each other, even in this time, because of technology, even this time of COVID, you may not be able to walk with them for obvious reason, but you can still be an encouragement to each other in terms of what you do to be healthier. I appreciate that. That is actually an absolute great solution. And that's leading us into our last segment about the solutions. A partner, an accountability partner, someone who will call you accountable for what you eat, drink, and do, or not eat, drink, or do. And I love that you call each other on the phone because honestly, you can actually talk on the phone as you're walking. You know, even if you're not in the same place, same space, you can still encourage one another on that journey. And so I believe that this is, that's why we, we, God has allowed us to come together for such a time as this, because we want to think of ways that we can practically solve the problem of appetite. Yes, we know it's a problem. We've seen it in the Bible days. We've seen it in the, in the world in which we live. We have it in our own households. You heard my story from yesterday. Every day we're tempted with something with appetite. And so we wanna make sure that we are gonna move into the next section. And it's about our practical solutions to control appetite. It is not impossible to control your appetite. Emily, Dr. Sinclair, just as you all purposely set your children up by giving them fruits and vegetables and healthy food because you wanted them to be healthy children, we can set our sing ourselves up as well. We can be a witness to those with whom we come in contact with. Dr. Sinclair said every day she's talking to someone about diet just simply because you know, she's trying to get them on a healthy journey so that maybe they don't have to end up in surgery. But sometimes people continue to do. We know of people who have habits and they continue to do them even after receiving a diagnosis. And so we wanna move on to some solutions and we're gonna wrap this up. But some of the practical solutions for controlling appetite and resisting temptation. So let's talk about what is our Christian duty as it relates to control of appetite. We've talked about that a little bit, but what do you think is absolutely our duty to control our appetite? We've talked about our body belongs to God. We talked about restores, anything else that I missed? I think we have to give it over to God because like I say, I think there's so many people, even Christians, when it comes to losing weight and, and eating more healthy and exercising, we pray about everything else that comes, but we really don't pray about, Lord, I need to do this. I need to change my lifestyle. Can you please help me? You know, if someone has cancer, everybody's praying. <laughs> but when is the last time you heard somebody say, Come to say, my prayer request is that I really need to lose some weight. I, I need to exercise more. Please pray for me. When is the last time you heard it? And I say we, because I'm guilty of that too, that I, I can't think of a time when I, I started to pray about it myself, but I really can't think of a time when I said to my friends, you know, please pray for me. I'm, I, I, I really do need to lose a few pounds. Please pray for me. We, we just don't. Well, ironically, this week, I actually heard someone say that. So they've started walking and they are started eating differently, no more sodas and sugary stuff. And they asked for me to pray for them. So it is rare, 
that's the first time I had heard it in a, who knows if ever. So I agree with you, Dr. Sinclair. We, we need to take this to the altar and begin to pray about it and ask God to heal our bodies inside and out, starting with our heart. Because remember, this is a spiritual matter. Remember, this is an eternal matter. And so people, you know, we, once you learn truth, we need to live by truth. And so I think that our duty, our Christian duty really is to take it to God, take it to God and even pray for others who we know are wanting to get on a healthier journey. Any other thoughts? Mm -hmm. yeah. So we know that our um, eternal welfare depends on our choices. We've talked about that already. But you know, we didn't really talk about dress. We talked about eating and drinking, but dress is also in that category. And as you know, that many people who have difficulty with self-control for eating and drinking, they have difficulty with self-control for spending. Mm -hmm. Okay, so many times if self-control is not in control, we have difficulty with overcoming temptation in other areas as well. And so we don't wanna minimize that even the money that we spend, God's money for clothing and shoes and stuff for the house or whatever, um, it is, it is a, also an indicator of lack of self-control. Dr. Sankey, yes. uh, let me also say that um, when you look at, we're talking about appetite, Mm -hmm. um, part of the reason people have such a problem with appetite is low self-esteem. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the issues when it comes to dress, people are dressing, and I know people say it's, you know, we talk about the women, we never talk about the men. I guess with the women, it's, the dress is more obvious. But many times when you see young women dress a certain way, it is a reflection of choices that have been made or things that have been put upon them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not that you, you walk into church and your dress is all the way up here. It's not that you don't know it. Mm -hmm. You're either trying to rebel against something or you're trying to make up for something where you feel it is. Because these are, you know, it's, it's not that they're dumb. They know they're coming to church. They know they're coming to church. And not everybody has to dress the same. And you can look nice and very attractive. It doesn't mean that you have to look like you have a different profession. Um, or as Pastor King once said when he preaches our church, he says, when they left half of the fabric in the factory, don't buy the dress. <laughs> I never forgot that sermon. But it's, it's not a reflection so much of, you know, that dress is too tight for you. It's a matter of what is going on in their mind. And that's why it's an eternity issue, because that's the what they're wearing is not really the issue. Yeah, and you know, and I think that is really true because our decisions begin in the mind, and then it's expressed through our body, what we wear, what we eat, what we drink, and it's really important for us to make sure that we control our appetite. And when we say appetite, we've been talking about food and drink, but our appetite for many things, because what happens is our appetite for sin becomes lax. In fact, you can see, begin to see things and don't even think there's anything wrong with it. We see that people will watch TV. They have all types of stuff on there. And honestly, they're, they're numb because their, their food appetite has taken control over them. We're really out of time, but I'm gonna go through these really quick. So self-control leads to appetite control. This is critical that we clearly understand that when we have control of our appetite, when we have self-control, we can control our appetite. And really, God is really just trying to prepare the way for us. He really is. He, he has already done that. Jesus passed over the ground, which man, he knew man would travel. He knew that. And our Lord has prepared the way for us to overcome. Isn't that good news? Mm -hmm. That's great news. We can use scripture. We can make sure he's prepared the way for us to overcome. Not even by thought did he yield to temptation. And I think this is important for us to be mindful of because sometimes we keep on thinking about that ice cream that's in the freezer or think about, keep thinking about things that, that we know are not healthy for us. Um, and I'm telling you, the, the struggle is real because as I was passing by the, the fast food place yesterday and was so hungry, the struggle was real. And so we have to know that we have to not even in thought, I can't even think that I was, was eating their food because that's a, temp, that's a sin. We talked about Daniel purposely in his heart, you know, and this is a, this last bullet is really important in association with unbelievers, people who do not believe like you do. It is important that you do not allow yourself to be swerved from your right principles. 
we go out to eat, we go to potlucks. I was telling Emily that my dad was a vegan as long as I knew he was a vegan. And he never, if I can, I'm not gonna say never ever, but I can rarely remember him even eating at a potluck. And I thought it's because he didn't want to eat from someone else's table. He didn't know how they prepared the food. I think it might've been all of that, but I don't think he knew what was in it. So he didn't want to take a chance. So oftentimes he would carry his own food and only eat his own food. So when we're, when we're among unbelievers, we do not need to feel like we need to eat what they're eating, especially if they're not eating temperately. It is important that we do not, do not um, confuse our minds by eating intemperately. This week, the Lord brought to me, and if you have not read Proverbs 23 in a while, I would encourage you to do God's lay to this scripture this week. And it says, when you sit, sit to eat with a ruler, now it talks about a ruler, but this is talking about when you sit to eat, period. <laughs> Consider what's before you. Do not be a man or woman given to appetite. Desires of dainties, for they are deceitful meat. Eat not bread of him that has an evil eye. His heart is not with thee, and the morsel shall be vomited up and loose thy sweet words. Do not be among wine bibbers and riotous um, eaters of flesh. The drunkard and the gluttons. He, God's putting these people in the same category. They come to poverty and drowsiness and shall clothe a man with rags. And then the wine biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. So this is serious business where Proverbs, Solomon, the wisest man to write about when we sit down to eat, how we should eat, what we should choose. And we've all been to these big, large buffets where we get 10 and, three, 10 and 12 things on our plate and go back for more. We cannot be gluttonous and we cannot be drunkards. We need to be mindful. Two or three things on a plate. I mean, yeah, two or three or four things on a plate is adequate um, nutrients for the body. And sometimes we put so many things in the body that is difficult for the body to digest it because they're just not desi designed to digest it. So again, as we wrap up, it's really important for us to really be clear on how we care for our body. It's important that we don't take light of it. We have to think about eating well, not necessarily, you know, we just have to think about eating well. I mean, we have to think about the body. We want the Holy, we want to be able to hear the Holy Spirit. I know I do. All of us do. We want to be able to hear the Holy Spirit speaking to us. And it's important that our minds are clear. I have a few more slides and I'm going to wrap it up. Just... And Jennifer, verse Sue said, if you're given to appetite, put a knife to your throat. Yeah, I, I didn't put that on there. But that I, out. <laughs> I should have put that on there, but I was like, I don't want anybody to so serious it. They, they should go out there and put a knife to their throat. But I, it was <laughs> it's in there. Well, I think it just yeah, shows how serious it is. Truth and nothing but the truth. It does say put it. So I'm going to encourage y'all to go back and read that. Read that um, that scripture because it. this is how serious it is. It really is. And then lastly, timing of meals. A second meal should never be eaten until the stomach has had time to rest from the labor of digesting the preceding meal. If a third meal is eaten at all, it should be light and several hours before going to bed. Many, I have actually cut back to two meals a day. And I've been doing that for a while, but my dad only ate two meals a day. And it's funny that I've, as I've gotten older, I've picked up a lot of his practices, but I don't need, to, I eat at 10 in the morning. I eat by five in the afternoon. I'm good for the day. Um, the last uh, says perseverance in self-denying course of eating and drinking will soon make plain wholesome food palatable. And it will soon be eaten with greater greater, greater satisfaction than the epicure enjoys over the rich dainties. The simpler the food, the more nutritious the food, the, you know, you'll begin to um, get an appetite for healthy foods. And then resisting, this is important. The Bible says resist the devil and he will do what? Flee from, from you. Flee. But many of us not resisting. So he's standing right there beside us, still tempting us. But if we resist him, he'll go on about his business. To him that knows to do good and doeth it not, it is what? A sin. 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 And, the, and Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that's what we've basically been talking about. There's a book by Doug Batchelor called Tips for Resisting Temptation. And there's many ways. And I love the way it's outlined, you know. Um, and, it, and this is any temptation. It doesn't say food. It doesn't say it's any temptation. 
But I, the number one is remember the reward. When we eat, drink, and do all to the glory of God, we can, we can be assured that God is with us. We have the reward of heaven, right? Believe in the badness of sin. Don't love money. Get ready to flee. Be ready to leave the dinner table if you need to, if unhealthy food comes to the table. Don't follow the crowd. Plan to stay busy and have a plan. Like Jesus had a plan. He knew what he wanted to do. Daniel had a plan. We should also have a plan. Know yourself. Know what tempts you and stay away from it. Overcome evil with good and care for your health. And recognize that you can't escape any temptation with God's help. So we've talked about a lot today. And the, the biggest takeaway for me is now what do we do? Are we willing to forego our appetite? Are we willing to step away and say, God, I know I need your help. And the only way I'm going to make it is with your help. And I think that's, that's really where I want to close out with is that it's only by God's grace. It's only by his help will we overcome temptation. He, we, we can't do this by ourselves. Men, Emma, even when we talk every week, which we love talking every week, um, we talk about the challenges that we all encounter. And so we know that it is important that we overcome. So in summary, many are incapacitated for labor, both mentally and physically by overeating and the gratification of lustful passions. There are men of excellent natural ability whose labor does not accomplish half what it might if they were temperate in all things. So people can do great things, but if they're intemperately, they won't accomplish as much. Thousands who may have lived have passed into the grave, physical, mental, and moral wrecks because they sacrifice all their powers to the indulgence of appetite. Christ left an important lesson about the dangers of making eating and drinking paramount. It enfeebles the moral power that sin does not appear simple. We talked about that. Crime is lightly regarded because now we can watch stuff on TV. People can get killed and die and we don't think anything of it. Passion controls the mind until good principles are rooted out. And when we do not control our appetite, God is blasphemed because we were made, we are made in the image of God. We're to care for our bodies so that we can hear the Holy Spirit speaking to us. So the question that I have for you all is what important lessons did you learn about control of appetite? It is not enough to hear, but what will you do? And then what thing will you change to be more temperate in appetite? So it's important that we give these lessons and learn these lessons, but there has to become a point where we make a decision to make a change for better, make a change for eternity because really we know that this world is ending. We know Jesus is soon to come. He wants to save us. And the best thing we can do is control our appetite. Control based on what I read this week is linked to spirituality and our soul salvation. All three matter to God and directly benefit self. If we have self-control, it benefits us. If we have spirituality, it benefits us. If we have soul salvation, it benefits us. So God is not asking us to do anything that he will not help us do. Again, our eternal welfare depends on the use we make during the life we live of our time, our strength, and our influence. So live well. Avoid the problems caused by uncontrolled appetite in eating, drinking, and dressing. Adhere to our obligations to God of controlling the appetite, which helps us to care for the body, the soul, and the faculties entrusted to us, and then practice controlling your appetite and resisting temptation. I wanna say thank you for joining us today. I do apologize that we went over, but the discussion was just so, so, so interesting about what we can do to control our appetite. I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Emlyn. Okay. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sankey and Dr. Sinclair for that wonderful discussion. We have learned a lot. Um, we learn about bringing our, our thoughts um, under the submission of Christ so that we will not wonder and are thinking about food and things that we should not be eating. Bring those under submission so God can control our appetites. Be like Daniel, purpose in our hearts that we will not sin against God, against God with our appetite. 
that we will follow a healthy diet and the temperance. Um, before we close out, we want to um, get, open the opportunity for anyone who has a prayer request. I noticed in our chat, we have Alicia, Alicia is requesting prayer. She needs to lose a few pounds and she's requesting prayer for losing, to lose some weight. I also have in the chat, um, there is a web, there is a web page uh, uh, about um, burgers, lentil burgers, how to make a lentil burger. Um, you can copy that, that website. I guess you can highlight it and put it on your, on a, um, I guess go to your, not your email, but on any, any um, site on your computer and you can copy that web, that web page and open it up later so you can see how to make a healthy lentil burger. Um, we're encouraging everyone to eat healthy. So I'm just giving you some few tips on how you can start that process. Um, also, Ms. Edwin, um, yes. I'm on Facebook and someone started sending me things. It's a Facebook site that's called Adventist Recipe Swap. Oh, okay. And basically they're swapping all kinds of recipes. I was just going over the other night um, because even before I had joined, I've always made vegetarian food because I know it's important. So um, they have all kinds of recipes on there, stir fries, things with tofu, um, beans. Uh, they have a few with the soy substitute, but not all. Many of them have to do with just using the natural products, the beans and other stuff to make. So you can just look it up on Facebook, um, right. Adventist Recipe Swap. And I'm sure you'll find some other recipes there for just for some things. Because what I tell people, I said, even if you don't make a dedication to be vegetarian, you can just increase the plant base in your diet. If you do that, you automatically cut down on your calories mm -hmm. just by increasing. If you have two meals a week that are plant based and you substitute those for meat based diet, you already, you know, took out two meals in terms of high fat and calories down to smaller meals. So there's so many little tips that you can do. Wonderful. Thanks Thanks for that information. So Adventist um, recipes, we can go there and find some more recipes on healthy living. Wonderful. Um, so before we close out, we want to have a word of prayer. Anyone else with um, a prayer request, you can write it in your chat. You know, if you don't want... Um, to speak out loudly because I also want you want you to know that we are recording and um, we're going to put this on YouTube. And if you do not want your voice to be heard, or you don't want your name to be, um, you know, to be said over the internet, um, you do not have to do that. You can just write it in the chat. You don't have to speak, I should say. You can just write it in the chat and we will see the chat and we can pray for you. Emlyn, before you close out, I must thank Dr. Sinclair. She, oh my, she's amazing. And I appreciate the, the information that she brought forth today. Um, things that she's seen in her practice and just um, those personal experiences. Dr. Sinclair, you are amazing. I wanna say thank you. I appreciate you. Thanks and, for the um, invite. You love yeah. ministry, and I, that's what I like about working with you. Every time there's an opportunity for ministry, she raises her hand, and I thank God for you because that's exactly what we're on this journey together, and I appreciate you sharing your knowledge today. Emma and I want to thank you as well. It's been such a pleasure to work with you these last eight weeks. Well, actually, we've been on this journey for six yeah. months, but anyway, yeah. I do want to publicly thank both of you for just making today's program so dynamic and so interactive. Um, just want to say thank you before you close out with prayer. So my prayer request is thanking God for the both of you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank I you. have a prayer request. I want to pray for my nephew um, who's going through a lot right now and that God will control his mind and direct him in the right way. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I did not see any more requests. So we're going to end with prayer right now. Heavenly Father, we come before you because we know that you are our father and you want to hear from us, your children. And when we come before you, you have open ears and mind to hear what we have to say. 
So we invite you now as we into our midst, as we commit um, this prayer request to you. Forgive us, dear God, of where we have come short and hear our prayers tonight as we um, pray for Alisa that she will be able to lose weight, dear God. Give her the strength and the courage that she will be able to um, do this great work of losing weight because the devil knows that when we feel good, we can communicate with you and that you know we can draw closer to you and he does not want this. So dear God, give her the um, support system around um, you know, her that she can um, be able to follow through. Be with others who maybe have the same desire but did not want to share. Be with all the um, participants and all the um, those who are listening to um, this evening. Help them that whatever their desires are, that you will grant it according to your will. I bring my nephew before you, dear God, that you will help control his mind. You created his mind. You know all what he's going to give him the strength, dear God, that he is able to face all the challenges that he has to face in his life. I do pray that. I, you know, for Jennifer and for myself and for what we are doing, continue to guide us and give us the knowledge we need to um, continue this great work. Thank you for the presenters today. Thank you for what we have learned and what we have heard. Help us that we put it into practice. For we have asked these things in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Amen, Amen. everyone. So Thank keep the challenge you. up, keep drinking your water, Amen. keep taking things out of your diet that you know <laughs> that is not healthy. And um, today we talk about temperance and let's try to be temperate in all that we do. See you next week. Um, next week, our topic, oh my, I forgot. Our mm -hmm. topic next week is going to be continuing on chapter nine and it's going to be in regards to um, oh, um, eating healthy. Thanks, everyone, again. Take care. Bye. 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 All the way from Tobago. Hey. All the way from Tobago. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hey, Glad, you when you <laughs> Glad when you guys can join us. Yes, Carol, this is so interesting. You guys, well, I fell asleep. I came on a little late, but it, this is, oh man, it's sending so much guilt through my brain cells. <laughs> but I know with God, I can do it. I can do it. I'm supposed to go out tonight and you guys just didn't do me right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, I have to go. Doctor, no, I have to go and pick and choose what I eat tonight. Because this thing, I mean, the spirit is really speaking to me that we need to do this right. That's right. Yeah, I know you can do it, Moya. Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. Praise God. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, I'm really trying to bring up, I think, because I send this link to a lot of folks today, but I have to let them know that, um, um, that the that the password, what I recognize, the password is a capital S. Yeah. So a lot of oh, people yeah. like, wasn't able to get on oh, because okay. maybe they didn't uh, realize it. But I'll give them it word of mouth. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Thank you. But this thank is you. a blessing. This is a blessing. Sorry. Thank, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for your feedback. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> we keep in touch. Yes, Carl. No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm going to stop the recording, M. Okay. <laughs>